Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to this installment in the ongoing Yellow Version Challenge series. I'm Druzy, and today we're doing another solo Pokemon challenge, this time using the fancy cat, Persian. Persian has incredible speed, tied with Starmie for number 7 of all Gen 1 Pokemon. This means we're likely going to be getting a lot of critical hits today, since in Gen 1, base speed and critical hits are tied together. The rest of Persian stats are pretty average though. We may have some sticking points, but overall, the attack isn't terrible. And so, as long as we're attacking first, I think we should be good, because we won't be as frail as we were with Doug Trio. For this challenge, we're going to be forcing our rival to choose Flareon due to its high attack. So this means we're going to need to win the lab battle. But hopefully that's not going to be too challenging, since we do start out with Bite, and Bite is a base 60 power move, and it can cause flinching, and we also get stabbed because it's not Dark-type until Generation 2. In fact, Dark-type doesn't even exist in Generation 1, so I guess you could say it doesn't become Dark-type until Generation 2. And you see right there, two bites is all it takes. That's an easy win. Persian off to a fantastic start here in the early game. I chose Flareon because I think it gives the rival the most difficult team for us to face. It's going to be able to do the most damage, and we already would have a speed advantage over Jolteon, so that really doesn't come into play. Now you're seeing the learn set on the left for Persian and the TM list on the right, and I think you can already see we've got Body Slam, that's fantastic, it's a stab move. Bubble Beam might give us some water coverage, so we can take out some ground types pretty quickly. Thunderbolt, fantastic move, that's always great in the Elite Four. And then we also pick up Slash by level up, which will always be a critical hit thanks to the Gen 1 mechanics. So there's a lot of opportunities here. Really interested to see how this one ends up playing out. We make it to Brock at level 10, and I decide to see how we match up since we have a pretty strong early game moveset and we've been doing pretty well in the early game. Thanks to Screech, we're able to lower Geodude and Onyx's strong defense. Even though it can fail, which you do see here, it's not too bad. We also can get critical hits, which also do less damage because of the way general mechanics work, but you know, it gives and it takes away. After a little bit of a battle, Geodude goes down just before we get into red health, we level up, and now we're taking on the Onyx. Against the Onyx, as we do anytime we have a status move, we will attack until we get Abide, and then we'll switch into that status move, and this time we have Screech to lower his defense and Growl to lower his attack. Thanks to a lot of bides from Brock, we're able to lower his defense down six stages and his attack down twice. That puts us in a fantastic spot for the rest of this battle. Bite does so much damage there. And then we get a crit, but is able to hang on, but Bite's able to take him out, level up to level 12, take our Cascade Badge, and move on to the next part of our run. For Persian being a normal type without access to special moves, it did about as well as I could hope there. Screech really helped lower that defense there. But speaking of special moves, now that we're into Mount Moon, we're able to pick up the TM for Water Gun and teach Water Gun, and now we have a little bit better coverage for those rock and ground types we'll be facing for the rest of the run. While it's not a strong move by any means, it is going to give us a little bit better coverage, and we really won't have it for too long, so it's just to help us in case we run into a hiker by mistake or something like that along the way. After clearing Mount Moon, we make our way to Cerulean City and make a slight detour to the Hidden Rare Candy, and I decided to take Misty on first instead of Rival 2, because normally I go the other way, but with Bite and Screech, I'm feeling pretty good that we can take out Misty here. Staryu comes out first, and our Bite causes a flinch, so we're able to take it down and move on without taking any damage. Fantastic start. Starmie's out next, and Misty starts with an X Defend, and our Bite does terrible damage, and I immediately start to second guess my decision to face Misty first. Water Gun and Bubble Beam are both hitting so hard, and even after a couple screeches to lower the Starfish's defense, we're just not quite able to take it out, and then a Bubble Beam at the end finishes us off. So, with that in mind, I think it's about time to go and try Rival 2 out instead, and, you know, take that loss in mind, we'll come back and we'll get our revenge a little bit later. Rival number two is definitely the weaker of the two options here. Definitely should have started with him instead of going to Misty. It's a fairly easy battle. We go with Bite the entire time, spam it through, and it takes out his entire team. Everyone is at least a two shot, so really never in danger of losing this fight. With the rival out of the way, we can now go and do all the rest of the trainers north of him, including Nugget Bridge, and then all the trainers on the way to Bill. So we come back against Misty at level 22 this time. Staryu isn't a one-shot without a crit, but it doesn't do much damage, and that brings out Starmie. 
We start with a Screech now that we outspeed. So now we can do even more damage. Our attack did over half the damage. That is fantastic. I decided to finish it off with our signature move, Payday, just for fun. But that was a fantastic battle. A couple extra levels made all the difference there. And after beating Misty, now we have access to Bubble Beam, which is fantastic. It has a chance to do a lot more damage than we would get with Water Gun. So now we have a Water Type move for the rest of the run if we choose to keep it. Our next stop is the SSAN, and obviously we're going to stop and we're going to pick up Body Slam. We get Stab. It's a fantastic move. It can cause paralysis. This is just such a great move. I, I try to get it anytime we can learn it, and it's only behind one trainer, so really not much of a stop off either. So we're going to pick it up and immediately learn it, and then we're going to go and we're going to show off Body Slam's amazing power against rival number three. Before we actually go and battle our rival though, I am going to make one small detour, and that's going to be to stop off at the rare candy that's in one of the one of the cabins over here. So. I know it's this one. I have to figure it out. You see me hesitate there. I, I forget quite a bit once you get on the SSN. Very confusing sometimes. Even though I've played this game probably hundreds of times in my life, it still sometimes gets me. But you see in this battle how strong Body Slam is, making short work of both the Growlithe and the Ponyta, clearing the way for our rare candy. So with our small detour out of the way, we bump into our rival as we go to see the captain, and he challenges us to a fight, and it's really not even fair at this point. Body Slam is so strong. It's on an evolved Pokemon. There's just no chance in this battle. He does get off a quick attack. But other than that, it is a one-shot sweep with the entire team. And that is just a fantastic start for, for Persian. Loving using this Pokemon right now. Really doing a fantastic job and making great time. Now that we're able to move on to the captain and get cut, We'll then head directly to Lieutenant Surge. We won't heal, and this will save a little bit of travel time, and I try to do it as many times as possible whenever you make your trip to Vermilion. It just saves a little bit of time in the overall gameplay and a lot less backtracking. So Lieutenant Surge starts our cat and mouse battle, and we're gonna outspeed, and then we go for Body Slam, and we get a Paralysis right away. Mega Punch does do pretty good damage. A Mega Kick might have taken us out. A Thunderbolt might have taken us out as well. But we came in at less than half health. This battle was never really going to be a problem. But we also pick up Thunderbolt as a result. And that is crucial. We immediately teach it to our Persian. And then we're able to have a really strong move to cover both flying types and water types moving forward. Thunderbolt also gives us a special attack. So that way if we run up against a really strong defensive Pokemon, we have another option to play as well. So now flash forward to Celadon and we do some shopping. I usually don't show this because I don't think it's the most important part of the run, but I do pick up a Pokedoll and I usually get some vitamins here as well with the money we've earned up to this point. Uh, the kind I pick up really depends on the Pokemon and how I'm doing on the playthrough and how I plan to move forward. For Persian, I go for Protein and Calcium to boost both my attack and special, since we really don't need any more boost with speed. Then of course we make our way to the roof and get our drink for the Saffron Guards. Today I think they needed a Soda Pop instead of a Water, so I went with that. After navigating the rocket hideout, we get a battle against Giovanni, and we get and once we beat him, we can get the Silph Scope and move on with our journey. Bubble Beam takes out Onyx in one shot. This is the reason I love having Bubble Beam on Persian for this. Makes this so quick. Rhyhorn's also a one shot. Then we get a mirror match Persian versus Persian. Our body slam does way more than his bite does, and it's a two shot. We level up to level 31 and defeat Giovanni so we can claim the Silph Scope and move on to face rival number four in Pokemon Tower. So as we navigate our way over to Pokemon Tower to face Rival 4, I'm not expecting this to be too difficult. It's been pretty easy in his battles so far, and I don't expect it to change here. Although he does now have a Fero, we'll test out and see how Thunderbolt does. And Thunderbolt is a one-shot, which is fantastic. Magnemite's out next. Body Slam makes quick work of the Magnemite. Then out comes Shelder, who also goes down to a single Thunderbolt. Sandshrew's out next and goes down to a single Bubble Beam. And then Eevee comes out, and we don't quite get the perfect round as it goes for a quick attack, getting a little bit of damage in before we sweep his team with Body Slam. All one-shots here. I mean, rival number four always seems a little bit easier than the rest of the rivals, but this past couple runs, he seems even easier than normal. Now that we've cleared Pokemon Tower, I decide to go back and face Erica in the Grass Gym. I'm thinking Body Slam should be enough to get by a Grass Pokemon, but Sleep or Razor Leaf could really be a problem here. 
We're pretty even leveled with her team, which starts out with Tangela, and our body slam hits for just under half here, but we do get paralysis. Mega Drain does okay damage, but we end up taking Tangela out with about two thirds of our health left. We even bells out next, our body slam doesn't quite take it out, and that critical razor leaf does so much damage. It's always going to be a critical in Gen 1. And then our body slam also doesn't take out Gloom, but we survive after a stun spore and an acid with two health. That was intense. I mean, I thought we were done for once we hit that acid, but you know, sometimes things go your way in this game. We have a couple decisions we can make at this point. It's pretty wide open for us, but I decided to take on Rival 5 ult because so far he's been pretty easy and Rival 4 was, was a pretty good sweep on our part. Sand Slash is out first and our Body Slam doesn't do quite as much as I thought it would, but we we're able to take it down thanks to uh, eventually using Bubble Beam and making the right decision there. And then Cloyster's out next. We use Thunderbolt, does half, Clamp misses, and then we take it out with Thunderbolt. Magneton's out next. And we go for Body Slam, and we get a Paralysis right away. It gets a weak tackle, then it's fairly paralyzed, so we switch to Bite to take it out to save a little bit of our Body Slam PP. Cadaver's out next, and we get a one-shot with our critical hit with Body Slam. I don't know if the crit mattered, and hopefully we don't have to find out. And with that, now we're going to bring out Flareon and his last Pokemon. I go for Bubble Beam, thinking Super Effective is going to be better, and it does no damage at all. We get Sand Attacked, and Body Slam is doing so much more. Critical Hit Fire Spin could be a problem, but it only goes two turns. Then we hit a Body Slam to take it out and beat Rival Fievel on our first try. So after beating our Rival pretty easily, we take on Giovanni and we don't have any Body Slam PP. And then we get a Crit Hit Double Kick. So that was a quick attempt. We got destroyed. We need to get healed up. So we go do that and come back. A Body Slam is doing much more than Bite was. Obviously, we knew that would happen. And we're able to take Nidorino out in two hits. Persian's out next, and our Body Slam does good damage, and Giovanni uses his guard spec because Giovanni's going to do what Giovanni's going to do. And then we get a Bubble Beam one-shot on Rhyhorn to bring out Nidoqueen. I go for Bubble Beam knowing it's super effective, but it really isn't doing much damage, and a Double Kick wrecks us. We get a critical Body Slam to take it into red health, paralyzing it as well, and then Giovanni uses a guard spec. An attack probably would have got us as long as he moved, and, you know, Giovanni losing battles because he loves guard specs too much. You gotta respect his commitment to his items, I guess. Since we're in town, I don't really want to come back to Saffron if I don't have to. I decide to take on Sabrina next. I hope we're going to outspeed most of Pokemon. We do have fantastic speed, but we are fairly underleveled. Although we do outspeed the Abra, so that's a good start. Kadabra's next, and we don't outspeed, and we get an accuracy drop thanks to Kinesis. After a few turns of setting up, Kadabra ends up going down to a critical hit Body Slam to bring out Alakazam. She tries to set up again. Body Slam gets the paralysis, so we might be doing good. And then a Psychic hits, and it crits, and that's a one-shot from full health. So maybe we're not ready for Sabrina yet, but I'm going to try again anyway. And we know Abra's a one-shot, so it really starts to get interesting once we get to Kadabra. Kadabra gets hit over half damage with the Body Slam, and then a non-critical Psychic takes us out. Man, that is brutal. I decided to give it one more try because getting Psychic against Sabrina seems kind of rare actually in yellow. And in the next battle, Kadabra goes for a full health recover and that Psychic again hits and it must have been a range because we survived with four health to bring out Alakazam who recovers at full health. We get a critical hit body slam with paralysis and then we take it out on the next level. Yeah, it might have been a little bit lucky, but at the same time, I'm going to take it and move on because realistically, I'm just going to go to another gym and then come back and do her again at a higher level. And so I think this will save a little bit of time overall. We throw away her favorite TM right in front of her, as we always do, because Psywave is terrible. And we dig our way out of the gym and head on to face Koga. The Koga fight is a really interesting one. And the first Venonat's not a problem. It goes for tackle while we take two body slams to take it down. The second Venonat, though, hits us with a Toxic before we can get our second body slam off to take it out. Against Venonat number three, two body slams takes it out, but we get hit with a double edge and some poison damage, so we're at 66 health heading to the Venomoth. Our first body slam paralyzes, and it's going to take three body slams to take it out. It sets up double team, and with Toxic, that could be a problem. We miss, and then luckily Koga uses an X attack instead of finishing us off, and that was amazing. Again, an ugly battle, but we'll take it. That's our sixth badge, and now we're moving on to Blaine. Blaine is a lot harder in yellow than he is in red and blue, and I've really struggled with him so far in my first couple runs. No different with Persian. Flamethrower takes us down in a one-shot. So 
try again in a couple other strategies, and eventually get this run where we're able to make it out of the Ninetales without taking any damage and moving on to the Rapidash for one of the first times. After our Body Slam does okay damage, he hits a takedown for a big damage, but our Body Slam doesn't quite take out the Rapidash. He traps us in a uh, Fire Spin and uses an Illegal Super Potion, uses a couple more Super Potions to hold on a little bit more, and then he traps us in Fire Spin and takes us down to 4 health, so we're not looking good going into Arcanine. I don't think I really have a chance here, but we get a critical Body Slam, then it sets up Reflect. We get a critical Bubble Beam, and he goes for Reflect again. So Blaine just never chose to attack once we were at 4 health, and he could have easily beat us. With that win, we now have 7 badges, so we're going to go and face Guard Spec's favorite customer, Giovanni, for our 8th and final gym badge. And while I've been making fun of Giovanni a lot in this video, he definitely turns the tables here. We're a bit underleveled, and if his Pokemon crit, they do massive damage. And that's obvious here when Doug Trio gets a critical dig and takes us out from full health. It turns out Giovanni's kind of a wall for us right now at our current level. Doug Trio can do big damage even if we don't, it doesn't get the crit to knock us out. And then even if we get past Doug Trio, we still have to deal with Persian. Persian has Fury Swipes, which usually does good damage. And if he uses Slash, we definitely end up getting knocked out if we have any damage from Doug Trio. And then even if we get by Persian, we still have to go into Nido Queen, and we usually have low health going into the Nido Queen battle. And so things have to go perfectly, even to get off a couple of attacks on the Nido Queen before we usually go down to Double Kick, like you just saw there. So after training on the rest of the trainers in his gym, and then also using a couple of rare candies, I decide to try it again at level 50. So now we're matching the level of the Doug Trio, and we're able to beat Doug Trio consistently. Not, not as scary anymore, but Persian definitely is still not consistent. You see I'm using Bite, and that's to hopefully get flinches, because a Slash is devastating to us still, even at this level. After a few more rare candies, we're at level 53, and things go smoother now, starting with the critical hit one-shot body slam on Doug Trio. I use Bite for the flinch chance on Persian, it's going to be a two hit anyway, before switching to Body Slam. Nido Queen's out next, Body Slam does more than Bubble Beam here. That critical hit double kick though is deadly and puts us in a bad situation, and we end up getting double kicked down on our next round. Since we had a critical hit on one of the double kicks, I decided to give another shot at level 53. This time things go a lot better. Doug Trio still goes down. I think Body Slam probably is a one shot. I went with Bite because I was afraid of the flinch. Giovanni uses two guard specs on his first two Pokemon because Giovanni loves guard specs, and we all know that. Nido Queen gets fully paralyzed. Then I switch to Bite to hopefully get some flinch chance on top of the paralysis chance, but eventually we're able to Body Slam it down and make our way to Nido King. Our Body Slam looks to be a three hit KO, and Double Kick does huge damage, taking us to red health. So I switch to Bite for the flinch chance get a critical hit, and then Giovanni uses a guard spec because he loves himself some guard specs, and then we get a critical hit bubble beam to take down Rhydon and get our 8th badge. I know some people are probably wondering why I didn't add Slash for this fight, since it is an incredible combination with Persian, getting Stab, and having that high critical hit ratio, but I really wanted that extra chance for Paralysis with Body Slam, and then also the flinch chance with Bite for this fight. Maybe I could have swapped it out for Bubble Beam, but I was definitely worried about the Rhydon and a crit body slam is going to do more than a crit slash would anyway, so I didn't know how consistent it would be, and I think it gives a better outcome this way. Anyway, we're on to rival number 6 and before we can get to the Elite 4. We start out by using body slam to get our way through sand slash, and as I just mentioned slash being a great move, sand slash shows it off and does almost half our health and damage. Execute comes out next and gets a stun spore on us, and then we get fully paralyzed and we get blasted by a solar beam. So yeah, that wasn't great. Let's try it again. Sand Slash is out first. We go for Bubble Beam this time, getting a critical hit, knocking it out on its first try. Executes out next. I go for Bite to get a flinch, and I luckily do before Body Slam takes it out. We go for Thunderbolt on Cloyster, and it hangs on, but it only goes for Withdraw, so no problem there. We use a Bite to finish it off. Magneton's next. I go for Body Slam, and it does over half damage. A Swift doesn't do too much to us, and Body Slam takes it out on the next turn. Kadabra's out next. Body Slam's an easy one-shot, and now that brings out his Flareon. And Flareon, we go for Body Slam, and we get a critical hit, and so that's a one-shot too. I don't think Flareon could have really done too much to us, but you know, it's nice to always get the critical hit to make things a little bit easier on us. So as we make our way to the Elite Four, 
The biggest concern I have is status moves, especially paralysis, since we're relying so much on our speed advantage. And yeah, we'll see how it turns out when we fight Lorelei here. I am fighting her as soon as I showed up. I just fought every trainer I possibly could in Victory Road to give us those extra levels because I knew we would need them in this case. Dugongs first and a couple Thunderbolts take it out. Clister's out next and we do Thunderbolt for it as well. It barely hangs on, triggers a retroactive super potion before going down, so no worries there. Slowbro's next. I've taught Mimic in place of Bite at this point, so now we can Mimic Amnesia. We get Psychic and the special drop, but that's not a concern here. With the Amnesia, we're able to tank any special attack that Lorelei decides to throw at us, and then we're able to make our own counter offensive. Thunderbolt will be a one shot on Slowbro. And then, with the badge boost glitch we've taken, Jinx is also going to be a one shot with Body Slam. I think it might be without it, but I never tested it. And then Lapras is next, and Thunderbolt, thanks to being plus six stages in Amnesia and our special being so high, is going to be a one shot as well. So Lorelei's surprisingly consistent right off the start of our Elite Four challenge. So we're going to heal up, and then we're going to face the fighting trainer Bruno, who might be scary if he was in a later generation. But in Generation 1, Bruno is usually pretty bad, so let's see how this one goes. I've kept Bubble Beam on our moveset specifically for this fight. I just wanted to make sure his onyxes were both easy one-shots, and so Bubble Beam makes sure that happens. And then other than that, we go for his Hitmonchan and his Hitmonlee with Body Slam. It gets a crit on Hitmonchan. It turns out that does matter, and we know that because Hitmonlee has lower defense, and it holds on. It just does an X defend, so no worries there. Out comes Onyx number two, who's also an easy shot one-shot with Bubble Beam. Machamp is out last, and we have full health going into the four-armed fighting type. I misclick and go for Bubble Beam instead of Thunderbolt, trying to take advantage of its lower defense. It gets a Gen 1 miss with strength, and then leers, and that means that we're able to take Bruno out without taking any damage and without really even getting attacked. Uh, Bruno has to be one of the worst Elite Four members. But do you want to take a guess at who isn't one of the worst four? If you guessed Agatha, you're right. Agatha is a bit of a problem for Persian. You see, half of her Pokemon are ghosts, and that means our normal attacks, and that means Body Slam, can't hit her. So we have to try to mimic something. Substitute might give us a little bit more staying power, but I'm afraid we're going to run out of Thunderbolt. So I go with Confuse Ray, hoping that we can avoid damage while also getting some damage on her Pokemon as well. We end up getting a Confuse on ourselves though, and then Substitute comes out. And we're not able to take it down with a thing single Thunderbolt. And so we're not really in a great place right now. We're struggling to take out Gengar number one. After the Gengar tries to make a substitute but doesn't have enough strength, we're able to finally take it out with a Thunderbolt. Moving on to Golbat. And Golbat survives our Thunderbolt, although it does get paralyzed. But it's not a one-shot, so we're going to take some damage here. You know, lucky we didn't take Toxic. But we're on to Haunter, and we get Confuse Ray. And then we go into Thunderbolt to try to whittle it down. Haunter isn't attacking us because it's using Dream Eater, which is only going to hit us if we're asleep. I switch to Bubble Beam to try to save some power points for Thunderbolt as we're starting to run low already because of how long this battle's going on. Body Slam on Arbok is fantastic, but we also get paralyzed, and that is not great, although we are able to take out the Arbok to move on to Gengar number two. We're still paralyzed here, and Psychic hits and gets a special drop right off the bat, so we're not in a great place. We're not going to be doing great damage, and right now we're also paralyzed, and now we have Parafusion as Confused Ray hits us as well. So we're not very attacking very much, we're doing damage to ourselves. we're fully paralyzed. This just isn't ideal, and we end up going down to a Psychic, and that means we have to start all over again with Lorelei. I'd like to say that that Agatha run was one of the worst runs I had, but unfortunately I can't say that as it was actually one of the better attempts. I did eventually work out a better strategy for Agatha after four or five attempts at her, but it really just depends on what Agatha decides to attack with, whether she decides to switch. There's so much variability in there, you really understand why some people call her the Agatha Lottery. And while I've been talking a lot about Agatha while this Lorelei battle plays in the background, this is part of the reason I'm showing this is because sometimes we don't even get to Agatha because Slowbro can hit a Psychic and as long as we get past Slowbro, we're, d we're good. But sometimes we didn't even make it past Slowbro. So sometimes things can go sideways. That's a very rare case. That's the only time I lost to Lorelei. But still, thought it was worth including because even when things go well and you have a good strategy, things can still go sideways. The very next attempt though, which you're seeing now, Things do go our way. We don't get that critical hit from Slowbro. We are able to mimic Amnesia. So as long as we're able to use Thunderbolt past the Dugong and the Cloister, 
and then we get through Silabar pretty easily, and we can then sweep through the rest of her team with Thunderbolt, followed by a Body Slam. You could also use Thunderbolt if you really wanted because your special's so high right now, but either way, Jinx is down, and then a single Thunderbolt against Slappers also go gets the win, and then you can move on to Bruno, and we know Bruno isn't very challenging. So essentially, once you beat Lorelei, you can move on to Agatha. Against Bruno, I'm not really putting any respect for him on this one. I don't even heal between the fights anymore when I go from Lorelei into Bruno, coming in at just about half health. I, you know, Onyx is a one shot. Then I go to Body Slam on Hitmonchan. I know Thunderbolt probably would be better here, but most of the time it doesn't matter anyway. Hitmon Lee does hang on and does hit a huge Mega Kick though, and this is when I start to get a little bit nervous. Bubble Beam will take out Onyx, but Machamp is going to be a three hit KO with Body Slam. So we get a Paralysis, which is fantastic. It goes for Leer, then it hangs on and luckily misses Submission. Submission in Gen 1 is terrible. All the fighting moves in Gen 1 are terrible. It only has 80% accuracy, so it wasn't that lucky overall, but still was a lot closer than I wanted it to be against Bruno. And we could have lost, which would have been very sad, but we ended up surviving and made our way back to Agatha. So now we can try out that new strategy I talked about earlier. This time against Agatha, I'm going to tweak when we use Mimic. And it's not going to be against one of the Gengars. It's actually going to be against the Haunter, and we're going to try to steal Hypnosis. Because in Gen 1, Sleep is incredibly overpowered, can last up to 7 turns, and we can't be attacked when the opponent wakes up. You can see here, Gengar number 1 goes down, actually knocked itself out by creating a substitute, so that was weird. I didn't know you could do that in Gen 1. We actually saw that earlier that you couldn't, and it was one of the reasons I knocked out Gengar 1. But here... We do a quick hypnosis, or we do a quick thunderbolt on Haunter, and then we are able to get hypnosis as the Haunter switches out for an Arbok. So we get it for free, actually, which is fantastic. We're then able to take out the Haunter here after we use hypnosis against it. Just gives us a little bit more time, a little bit more safety. Then Gengar number two is out. We immediately go for hypnosis because we outspeed. Then we can start hitting thunderbolt to just whittle it down slowly, and we can do it really safely here. And I found this to be extremely consistent. It was fantastic to actually be able to win the Agatha fight fairly consistently. Things could still go wrong against Gengar number one. But all in all, this was a pretty easy battle. And um, all things considered, I liked the way this turned out. So uh, with that, we're now on to Lance. We're going to heal up and then we're going to head on over to face the Dragon Trainer. I'm honestly not expecting too much resistance from Lance here. We have Thunderbolt, which will take care of his Gyarados pretty quickly, I think. And then with Mimic, we can take Ice Beam, which will also do a lot of damage to his team. So let's see how it turns out. Thunderbolt is a one-shot against Gyarados, which is fantastic, exactly how we hoped. Body Slam against Dragonair number one doesn't take it out, but Thunderbolt doesn't paralyze, so we're still in good shape. Dragonair number two is out. We Mimic Ice Beam, which is exactly what we need. Rap misses, so perfect. It wouldn't have hurt us that much even if it did. But then Dragonair number two actually hangs on from an Ice Beam, which was weird. Um, but it, he heals, and then we get a freeze, so he can't do much more damage to us. Aerodactyl is out next. I go for Ice Beam, hoping we can get a freeze. I think Thunderbolt probably would be a one-shot here with that extra five base power attack. But well, we won't find out here because I end up not doing it, and eventually we end up taking it down with the Thunderbolt, getting a crit that obviously doesn't matter as it was a very low health. Dragonite comes out. And Ice Beam is obviously a one-shot. We also get a crit for good measure. And with that, we've beaten the Elite Four, and we're heading to the champion for the first time in this run. So like we always do before facing our rival in the championship battle, we're going to heal up, we'll make sure we're full health, make sure we have full PP, just so everything is in great shape. And with that, we're going to head on into the next room and face our rival, queue up that championship battle music, and see how this turns out. So as the battle starts, he sends out Sand Slash, and our first move is going to be Mimicking Earthquake. And this is going to give us a very strong move against his Magneton and Flareon later on. I then go for Bubble Beam because it should be a guaranteed two-hit KO, plus it's a cool animation which we get to see now. As it goes for Fury Swipes, Bubble Beam then finishes the job off and we're on to the next Pokemon in Alakazam. Alakazam does not outspeed us and we're able to get a critical hit Body Slam to take it out. Executor is out next. And I think about going for Earthquake, but then decide Body Slam is going to be a little bit better. And we end up getting a critical hit on our second Body Slam, avoiding any Leech Seed damage. Now we get to see Earthquake take down Magneton, and it doesn't quite do it all in one, 
which does open us up to an attack, but Swift doesn't do too much damage, and we take out Magneton on the next turn. That brings out Cloyster, so obviously we're going for Thunderbolt, and we end up getting a crit, and I think it probably mattered based on how we've seen recent battles go, but I'm not sure. And then we go for Earthquake on Flareon, we end up getting it, and it takes out the Flareon in a single hit, winning us the championship, and earning us a place into the Hall of Fame. This was definitely a very interesting run. Persian has a lot going for it, and it performed a lot better than I initially thought it would. I think the high speed, giving so many crits, along with some sometimes crazy Gen 1 AI, made this really unpredictable, but it also made it a lot of fun. There were definitely a few spots that I could probably clean up, but these are always my first playthroughs with these challenges, so that's to be expected. Persian finishes with a level of 65 in this challenge, which is one above Sandslash, and it's time coming in just a bit faster with a time of 405. Even though it was a little bit faster, I don't know if it should go on top of Sandslash though. I've decided to put it just behind Sandslash for now. Persian was definitely more frustrating and a little bit more lucky than Sandslash was, and there was a lot more that could go wrong with those Sandslash runs. So I'm going to leave it to number three right now. Even though it was a little bit faster, that feels right for me. With Persian added to the tier list, now it's time to spin the wheel and figure out who the next challenger will be. So, as the wheel comes to a stop, we find out that our next challenger is going to be Chansey, a normal type, very different stat distribution, very unique distribution in Gen 1, so it'll probably be a very unique run, I'm looking forward to it. That brings us to the end of today's video. As always, if you like the video, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to be notified when the newest videos come out. If you have any thoughts or feedback, definitely leave a comment below as well. I'm just starting out making these videos and I really appreciate all the tips and tricks from everyone so I can keep improving and make these the best that I can for everyone. That's all for me for now. So until next time, I'm Drewzy and I hope to see you again soon.